Welcome back to Generals and Napoleon, episode 44, Sir John Kincaid, the possible inspiration for Sharp's Rifles. We have a special episode for you today. We are joined by my good friend, Luke Reynolds. He's a professor at the University of Connecticut Stanford campus. And he's also author of a book called Who Owned Waterloo? And if you'd like to order this fantastic book, you can get on Amazon or anywhere books are found online, or you can go to LukeALReynolds.com. Luke, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's, uh, It's really great to be here. What is uh, Who Owned Waterloo about? Can you tell us a bit more about that book? Yeah, absolutely. So it's a, it's a cultural history. It's actually not about the battle itself. I, I, make, I, make, you know, I say that it starts uh, the morning after the battle mm. uh, and goes from there. And it's really about um, Waterloo's memory in Britain. Yeah, we were talking before we came on, it, it, and I was like, why is Waterloo so fascinating? And you made a great point. It's just a it's a tidy way to end an epic era of the Napoleonic age. Don't you think? Exactly. I mean, you know, think about, uh, this is the, this is the, the analogy I often use, you know, think about how many modern movie TV book reviews you read that say like, this is great, but it doesn't stick the landing. Mm. We're conditioned to want a, a, an epic conclusion, something that wraps everything up with a bow and Waterloo is perfect for that. Right. Right. You know, even even though there's there's minor conflict after it and there's a whole bunch of debate and there, you know, there's an op- army of occupation for three more years. Mm-hmm. It's sort of considered this end point end point, And it's just very neat. Right. Right. And even though the battle itself was a slog and quite horrible. Yeah. It just it, it ends everything. You're right. Neatly in 1815. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's I mean, it, it's it's brutal. And one of the reasons it is so brutal is that it's so concentrated, right? It's actually a relatively small valley. And right. in that, you just have uh, three armies just coming together to beat on each other, to be put, yeah. to put it very simply. And, and all three armies knew what was at stake. So there really was no, there's no surrendering or, or you know, going backwards. It was all or nothing. Exactly. Hun- yeah. yeah, no, very much so. You know, uh, Wellington is not going to move. Blucher is not going to slow down. And Napoleon is going to do everything he can to split those two and break them apart. Right. Yeah, it sounds like a fascinating book. So uh, let my audience know they should check it out. Um, Thank you. My pleasure. We're going to talk today about uh, another interesting character, and his name is Sir John Kincaid. Can you kind of give us a a teaser about this fellow? Yeah, I mean, certainly. Well, so first of all, um, this is worth noting. Uh, He is actually... Arguably, I think the 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 lowest ranking officer that has that has appeared on your podcast yet. He is. Uh, he only made it to captain, and that was after the war. Like he was a he was a first <laughs> lieutenant at Waterloo. So that uh, begs the question: uh, Why are we talking about this guy on generals and Napoleon? He must have some story. He does. He. I mean, he definitely does. He he fights through the entirety of the peninsula, really, from. Um, uh, when does he get there? He gets there in uh, 1810. Right. And he's there through Toulouse and then on into uh, Waterloo. Um, but honestly, the real the real reason I like talking about him is that he has uh, a really, he writes two memoirs. Mm-hmm. And those two memoirs are in, in many ways sort of the, what they're partially responsible for kicking off that memoir boom in the 1830s. Right. Especially among the rifles. He's sort of the first of the rifle um, officers to write about this. Yeah. I was reading about a little bit of his uh, Waterloo memoir today. And, you know, he's talking about heaps of bodies on the battlefield. It was very descriptive. It was was almost like being there, you know? Yeah. He, he, uh, he, um, I'm not going to give him full credit for this. He's not like he alone did this. Right. Uh, but he is one of the first examples of, of something I talk about in the book, which is this sort of use of only eyewitness. Mm-hmm. Right. By the time he wrote this, he had, you know, Wellington's dispatches. He had some of Napier. Napier was publishing right. during this time. But he is very clearly, I am just going to be writing about what I see and what I experienced. Well, Let's dive into this fellow. Um, do we know a lot about his early life? We we don't know that. We so we know a decent amount about his his um his early life, but it's really through him. Mm-hmm. And uh, he was it to to give him credit. He was fully aware of what people were going to buy his books to read about. Mm-hmm. 
So he sort of glosses over it. Mm -hmm. um, but he was the he was the second son of a guy by the name of John Kincaid, right? He's named after his his father, right. uh, who who uh, was a lord, uh, or rather, as a, as Kincaid puts it, a small lowland Scottish laird mm -hmm. of a place called Dalheath House. Uh, and this is in Falkirk in Stirlingshire. It's about twenty five miles west of Edinburgh. Got it in Scotland, yeah. In Scotland, but very much lowland Scotland, right? We're not talking the Highlands here. Right, right, okay. Uh, he's born in January 1787, um, and he's he's educated locally, the Polmont School, which is, Polmont is just west of um, Falkirk. I'm mm -hmm. uh, sorry, no, just east of Falkirk. I apologize. <laughs> and um, you know, he uh, his his father dies relatively early. Okay. So his his mother sort of, I, you know, I get the feeling his mother doesn't want his kids their kids going away. Right. right? He, she wants them close by. And Polmont School is sort of perfect for that. Okay. Um, and then he joins the North York Militia as a lieutenant, mm. uh, which is, you know, pretty standard, you know, son of a uh, lowland Scottish laird. He's not going to serve in the ranks. Right. Um, he but, had uh, enough minor nobility to become an officer. Yeah, and he's, yeah. he's sort of gentry is, is probably the best way to put it in terms of the, the overarching uh, British aristocracy. Got it. Um, you know, uh, very, you know, a, a, a Scottish laird, but if you show up in, in sort of the, the ton houses in, in, um, in London and say, you know, I'm, I'm nobility because I'm a Scottish laird, they're going to be like, yeah, yeah, come back when you've got a Duke de Mernold drum and we'll talk. <laughs> um, so, so not really high up the ladder of there. So. No, very much, very much not. And I think honestly, you know, if, if, if his family had been English, uh, we'd probably be talking more about sort of untitled gentry. Mm hmm uh, but he has, you know, he's got this, and it's obviously his older brother who inherits uh, the lordship. So in 1809, um, the, this call goes out basically saying, you know, hey, uh, if you are in the militia, but you want to earn extra pay, you want to, you know, uh, get a fancier uniform, you want more attention from the ladies, they'll use any anything they can get, <laughs> right. um, switch to the regular army. Uh-huh. And there's a there's a draft of uh, draft in the in the volunteer sense, not in the in the conscription sense right. of the, the the militia regiment that joins the 95th Rifles. Mm. And he goes with them. And he's still fairly young at this point, right? like 22, 23, somewhere in there. He's, he's... Yeah, he's he so he was born in 87 and uh, he he transfers to the 95th in 1809. Right. OK, there you go. Yep. Yeah. So April, April 09. And he he takes the he becomes a second lieutenant in the rifles. Got it. Um, and, you know, he's very uh, he's very determined to um, to make his mark. Right. Uh, he, he writes in in uh, in the first chapter, and I'm going to quote here um, with the usual quixotic feeling of a youngster. I remember how very desirous I was on the march to deal, which is where the 95th were, were going to be based mm -hmm. to impress the minds of the natives with a suitable notion of the magnitude of my importance by carrying a donkey load of pistols in my belt and screwing <laughs> my naturally placid countenance up to a pitch of ferocity beyond what it was ca um, calculated to bear. Right. Okay. So he's, you know, very much the sort of early 20s swaggering right. young blood. So my question then, and I'm sure my audience is waiting for me to ask this, uh, how much of Sharp's rifles do you think is based on this fellow? So, you know, he's, he's definitely uh, of a higher birth status. Mm -hmm. And a higher existence status than Richard Sharp, right? Richard Sharp is famous for starting in the ranks, born in right. the in the in the um, uh, the rookeries of of London, right? And so there's not that, but very, but you know, he he does fight his entire career in the 95th Rifles. Mm -hmm. uh, he has contact with other regiments because he serves uh, at times in uh, in sort of administrative positions for the entire Light Brigade. Mm -hmm. um, so he's got that. And he's he's definitely there, uh, and I think honestly, it, it's where the inspiration comes from is less, you know, Sharp's trajectory and Sharp's uh, sort of overwhelming narrative drive to be at the center of every battle, right? Uh, and more just that Kincaid gives us an amazing description of everyday life, yeah, in the peninsula, yeah, and it's one of the best junior officer descriptions of everyday life, not only in the peninsula, but in the 95th. 
Yeah. Yeah, that first person account is really intriguing. Um, on the other side of the line, I just finished reading Marbeau's memoirs of, you know, a guy who, similar, he worked his way up and he was an aide to Marshall's Messina and Ogeru and, you know, really was almost at every front that Napoleon was on, you know, in Spain and Russia. And it was just a very interesting memoir to, to read through. Absolutely. One of those one of those ones where, you know, uh, he sits down and he's like, all right, people are going to want to read this. There's some interesting stuff here. And then the first editor gets his hands on it. The first publisher is like, oh, yeah, this is going to be fun. Right, right, right. Well, let's get back to our protagonist. So uh, he's just signed up. He's in the 95th Rifles. What 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 was his first baptism of fire? That, so it's, it's, it's not really a baptism of fire. It's actually more of a baptism of water. Uh, but he joins the 95th just in time to take part in the, in the Walcheren expedition. Oh gosh. Yeah. yeah that, that utter disaster slash nightmare slash yeah. whatever yeah. you want to call it. It was a mess. Um, yeah, it really was. So he sails from deal uh, with the 95th on the 74 gun HMS Namur, mm -hmm. which I love as a bit of coincidence because he starts on the Namur and his final battle of the war would be Waterloo, which was fought astride the Brussels to Namur road. Ah, irony. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't think he clocks that, but it was something I was reading, and I was like, "I right, that's that's a that's a fun <laughs> bit of sort of narrative, just fate right there." Well, to give our audience, in case they don't know of this Walker and expedition, I know it's a it's a mess. You want to give them a brief sketch of what happens there? Yeah. So basically, um, it's it's a, an attempt by the British uh, into the Netherlands in 1809, and it's attempts to open up another front in the Austrian Empire's struggle with France, right, to take some of the pressure off of Austria. Yep. Um, and basically, it's one of those ones where, it, you know, both, both sides are not overly pleased with it, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it's one where, a little bit like the Crimea, uh, it's conditions and sickness that are doing more damage than bullets can ever do. Right. 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 Um, you know, both sides lose around 4,000 dead, wounded, and captured. Yeah. But they, the French get about 5,000 sick and the British get about 12,000 sick. Yep. And I believe, yeah. And I, I just reading uh, Marshal Bernadotte, who was in charge of the French side, he just, he kind of knew if he just waited them out that mosquitoes and disease would take care of the British. Exactly right. You know, we've got we've got some modern some modern um, historians and sort of um, infectious disease experts have looked at sort of the the what's described both by the doctors and by the by the memoirists as, as the symptoms, mm -hmm. and they've come to the conclusion that it was that what's referred to as the Wallachian fever, the Wallachian fever, is actually a really nasty combination of malaria, typhus, typhoid, and dysentery, Ugh. which is just not a set of diseases you want. <laughs> Certainly not all at the same time. That's true. Yeah, seriously. So, I mean, it kills several thousand, as I said, infects over over 12,000. Okay. So does Kincaid, I, I know the British eventually evacuate just due to their losses. Does he evacuate with them or what happens to him in this time? He evacuates early. Uh, so he, he lasts precisely about, he lasts about three weeks mm. uh, in, in Walkren, uh, as he says, you know, playing at soldiers. Um and then uh, he, get, he gets what he describes as this horrible ague, which is, of course, the Walker and fever. Yeah. And he's invalided back to, to Scotland, mm -hmm. uh, where over the course of uh, nearly a year, he, he recovers. Wow. Uh, yeah, he, he credits his native heir yeah. for, for the recovery, um, which is possible. But I also think it's probably being you know, fed and having access to clean water and just not being bitten constantly by mosquitoes. Right. But yeah, I mean... Not the way you want your military career to start out. No, very much not. Um, you know, it's it's funny. He's sort of uh, he, the way the way he divides his memoirs is roughly sort of a chapter per significant thing, mm -hmm. uh, and he does end the first chapter with Walkren uh, because he's like, I don't want to start my second chapter. Uh, still in here. We're going to start the second chapter with the next campaign. He the first chapter is exactly three pages long. <laughs> Yeah, sounds like uh, we arrived. It was awful. We left. Yeah. That's that's pretty much exactly it. You know, it's it's a it's a one star TripAdvisor review. Yeah, I'd say I'd say so. Where does our protagonist go next? So it takes him nearly a full year to recover, as I said. Mm -hmm. um, but when he's finally fit, he rejoins the ninety fifth in the spring of eighteen ten, and he shows up at the barracks to find that his company isn't there. Mm. 
they're they've been dispatched to the peninsula to reinforce Wellington. Okay, so yeah, they're already in Spain and Portugal, so they kind of left him behind. So they're not they're not quite there yet, actually. Uh, so he's second battalion, and the first battalion is already in Spain and Portugal. Got it. But his his company is actually waiting off of Spithead to sail for the Iberian Peninsula. Got it. And all credit to him, like he applies immediately for it, is granted permission to basically rush there and join them. Mm-hmm. So he does. He meets his. He gets back with his company off of Spithead, and then they sail to Lisbon. Mm-hmm. Um. And he, he, they, you know, his, uh, he's not overly fond of the boat. You know, he describes it as extremely leaky and the captain is a total rogue. <laughs> uh, and, you know, shows up in Lisbon and is thoroughly unimpressed. Mm. Uh, he, he, he says at one point, sort of, there's no city, viewed from the water, there's no city like Lisbon that promises more and reneges less. Right. Or that, 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 that promises more and delivers less, rather. Right. You know, but it's, it's, it's funny to hear that description because now we know, like, Lisbon's like this beautiful, amazing city that people would love to go to. And I guess at that time it was not. So, yeah. 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 He's, I mean, he's also, you know, in, 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 to, to mention, he's not the most worldly traveled, like I'm going to look at other cultures thing. He's a little bit xenophobic in in, in places. Okay. Um, so, uh, but he, he, he leaves Lisbon. He goes up the, up the Tagus uh, mm-hmm. And his draft of reinforcements actually first experiences the Peninsula War as a retreat. Mm-hmm. He joins up with the army at Coimbra on their way back from the Battle of Busaco. Oh, yeah. And they retreat back to Torres Vedras. And he basically he says, he says, look, this is, this is not bad by the, by the experiences of the, the veterans and by the experiences of what I experienced later. But because this is new to me, it, it hammered me. You know, he talks about being not prepared, not being ready to carry that amount of weight, not knowing to hold on to his food and his water and all of that right. stuff. Right. Uh, so it, it really does read almost like, uh, you know, first letter home from boot camp. <laughs> right. This isn't what I signed up for. Yeah. I mean, and, and in fairness to him, he is he's relatively cheerful throughout, although obviously he's writing in the 1820s. Right. Uh, but yeah, but he is he is he is very clear about like, I was not ready for this. Right. So he arrives at the lines of Taurus Vedras, which, you know, uh, Wellington and Beresford had erected and Marshal Massena had a stop in front of. And what kind of happens from there? So he forms part of the garrison uh, of Taurus Vedras, mm-hmm. um, makes it clear that, you know, he's he saw basically one redoubt. He actually says those who wish a description of the lines must read Napier or someone else who knows all about them. <laughs> uh, don't look at me. I'm telling you about this one hill. Right. Um, but he sort of, you know, he he does he does sort of recall um, Messina's stopping there, mm-hmm. uh, and and basically says, uh, you know, I, if I was Messina, I would have done things differently. I would have tried to force them earlier, and then realized when I couldn't, I would have just retreated. Right. Um, yeah. But but he's with Wellington when Wellington follows Messina, Messina, yeah, yeah. Uh, and he sees action in the way we would describe it. Mm-hmm. Uh, for the first time at Santarum. Okay. Uh, and he goes through a bunch of the small actions there. He goes to Santarum, then Pombel, Redina, mm-hmm. Castelnova. Mm-hmm. Uh, he first gets sort of hit by the true impact of war, quite literally, at uh, Fazerus, where he's knocked unconscious by a musket ball that hits him above the left ear. Wow. Yeah, so clearly, you know, enough long range that, that it's not a killing blow. Right. Uh, but but still with enough power. And he credits his, his cap with saving his life. Uh, yeah. uh, I don't want a musket ball anywhere near my head or ear. So Right. Yeah. yeah. He, he, he recalls that he wakes up and, uh, you know, his head is pounding and he's utterly convinced that no, none of it exists above the mouth. Mm. And he's sort of very carefully prodding it with his hands and, and his, with his fingers and thumbs. Wow. He's lucky. Yeah, very much so. Uh, finds his cap 15 yards away. <laughs> Uh, and uh, that's a uh, thirty-five feet for for the for the American and uh, yeah. British listeners, um, and uh, you know rejoins rejoins the light companies, uh, the skirmishers basically. Yeah. Uh, encounters a soldier of the 60th, the Royal American Rifles, who basically says, "Oh, you're from the 95th. One of your officers died over there," and points to where Kincaid was. <laughs> and Kincaid responds by, "Oh yeah, I was that corpse." Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, I'm not dead, but yeah, that probably was me if I were there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Fun. Well, um, yeah, I, that's, I mean, those particular actions, I mean, uh, Wellington was fighting Masana, who was a pretty smart guy, and Marshall Ney, who was a pretty brave guy. So I'm sure it was a, a slugfest on, in Portugal and Spain there. Absolutely. You know, absolutely. And, you know, he's, he's right at the, at the, at what, you know, what, what, what we would call the sharp end, right. He's in the skirmish line. So he's the first on and the last off. Right. Um, but yeah, he walks away with just a concussion, uh, talks about how gratifying uh, dinner is after you've been wounded. <laughs> uh, and yeah, yeah. So you, you can't argue with that. And then keeps going, right. He's at, he's at Sabugal. He's the first battle that he's in that that sort of we would recognize uh as just sort of the the you know the, the cross swords on the map of the peninsular war the, the yeah. ones that are that are important enough to rate a mention is uh fuentes donoro yeah like a real set piece battle exactly yeah uh and he you know he's there he's then at um fuente uh ginaldo and aldea de pont okay um and then then he's you know he's he's clearly doing well because in may of 1811 he's made first lieutenant in All the 95th. Right. All right. And he's given command of uh, the 95th's Highland Company. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, the, the, the 95th doesn't have like a light company and a grenadier company, but they've got to organize these things somehow. So, like, we're just going to put all the Highland Scots in one of them. And you're Scottish, so we're going to put you in charge. Mm -hmm. um, and he's in charge of these guys. Uh, and, and, he, and he leads a detachment of them in a storming party at Theodad Rodrigo. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, so he's he's very much in the forefront of Theodore Rodrigo. Yeah, and that's where uh, Black Bob Crawford lost his life. And that's, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that, yeah. that was a vicious battle. And he was the commander of the Light Division. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that, that sort of the, the Light Division loses, you know, not only its head, but many of its men. Uh, and and sort of, you know, he's he's there at a storming party. He says he says that he, is, he would be dead. He wouldn't be writing this, except when he made the breach, he went left rather than right. Mm -hmm. uh, upon gaining the town and uh, the, 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 the detachment that he was with that went right uh, was wiped out by a detonating magazine. Wow. Yeah, but, but he went left. Again, lucky. lucky. Very much so. Very yeah. much so. Want to make a podcast? Spotify's got a platform that lets you make one super easily and distribute it everywhere and even earn money all in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters, and here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer, so no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. Then, you can distribute your podcast on Spotify, and everywhere else, podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are also available on Spotify. Right. And, and, and just so, so my audience knows, you know, with the sieges, and I was just talking about it in my last episode, you know, usually they make a breach in the wall. They offer the town to surrender. And if they do, they, you know, usually go somewhat light on the inhabitants. But if they turn it down, that's where they kind of say all bets are off, right? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, uh, sieges, sieges are one of, it's, it's funny because they are one of the both, in this period, like one of the most scientific right, portions of war. They're held up as sort of the ideal enlightenment of war. Mm -hmm. um, and they are the ones governed by some of the most rules. Mm -hmm. But if they turn down that surrender and if it goes to a storm and sack, mm -hmm. all bets are off. Mm -hmm. If your readers uh, are interested in that particular aspect, Gavin Daly, he's an Australian academic, just wrote a fantastic book on that called uh, Storm and Sack. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. which talks about all of that and actually really interestingly sort of does a, a deep reading of some of the people who write their memoirs about this stuff. Okay. All uh, right. Well worth, well worth looking into. All right. So we got two good book recommendations now. Okay. Yeah. Good. Absolutely. All right. Uh, so the sacking is going on. He saves a woman who's being attacked. Um, what kind of happens from there? So he, uh, he want he's, he's basically his, his, um, he and his his company are given uh, basically they're ordered to um, to patrol the the, the walls mm -hmm. and and sort of you know make sure basically that the chaos is limited to the walled city right right uh, and and that's what he does he 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 comments that he he reaches the walls they've already got the town and then he watches a Portuguese regiment storm them mm. um, again very much in that humorous like slightly xenophobic way. 
Right. You know, we're already in here. What are you guys doing? <laughs> we already did all the work. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, you know, he um, his 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 troops eventually are, are, are sort of said that they can stand down. They they stack their arms and sleep by them. Um, and he says, basically, he says, I can barely sleep because I've I'm I'm so worked up. Right. It's one of my um, it had ever been the summit of my ambition to attain a post at the head of a storming party. Mm -hmm. And my wish had now been accomplished. Mm. And he lived, right? Like, that's the other big thing. Right. He lived to talk about it. Yeah. 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 Um, so he, most of the night, he's sort of up and, and strutting about. And then he says, you know, in the, when, when Dawn's light hits him, I think it's a combination of fatigue and finally realizing, but basically he's just, he's just wiped out mm -hmm. because he looks, he looks down at himself and basically realizes he's covered with mud and dirt and blood. And the greater part of his uniform has been shredded. Right. Right. Uh, and he's like, oh, OK, yeah, this is actually, you know, more serious. <laughs> yeah, because when you're in the, the zone or that 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 tunnel vision, you really don't have time to look down and look at your uniform. Exactly right. You know, if, if you're worried about your uniform, you are doing it wrong at yeah. that particular point. Correct. Um, so but this is not this is nowhere near the end for him for sieges, right? Because he goes right from Tierra del Rodrigo to Badajoz. Uh, another one. Yeah, another one. Now, in this one, uh, he's clearly sort of, you know, all right, I've I've done I fulfilled my ambition to storm a breach. We're good. <laughs> he checked that off his list already. Exactly. So he's appointed acting adjutant of four companies of the 95th. Okay. And their job is to line the glass, the crest of the glacis and fire at the ramparts and at the top of the left breach. Mm -hmm. Basically, let's use the rifles for their actual proper purpose, which is long range suppression fire and right. accuracy. Right. So he sees the slaughter of Badahoff. But he's not caught up in in so much of the the, the adrenaline, right? Yeah, right. the front line, um, and so he he doesn't actually get into the city until the aftermath mm -hmm. when he when it you know when the sack is full still going on, right? Uh, you know, talking talking about how you know basically it deadens men's finer feelings and enables them to look upon the suffering of their fellow creatures with apathy, right? Um, and he, he records, you know, the Portuguese brigade coming in and they're erecting the gallows. And basically that's the thing that calms it down. Right. So that happens. Um, how does he kind of move on from there? It sounds awful. Yeah, I think, I think it is. Um, and I think he's really, uh, ironically enough, he's really grateful to see open air battle again, mm. uh, which is a very weird sentence. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but he's with, he's with the 95th at Salamanca. Right. And uh, so he's, I, I have to say from the beginning, he's a, he's a huge fan of Wellington, mm -hmm. right? He says it's like page 10 or something of his memoirs or even that he's like, I, I've been waiting to catch a glimpse of this guy and he's everything I thought he would be. You put him in a group of 500 men dressed the same and you could pick him out every time. Right. You know, he's, he's a fan. Does he have a lot of dialogue? I, obviously Wellington's busy with generals and strategy. Does he talk to the captains and lieutenants a lot? Uh, not really just, you know, the sort of, if, you know, if they're on duty in the pickets, it'll be sort of, you know, how fair are you, that sort of thing. Uh, nothing, nothing deep, but, but what, but what, uh, what Kincaid says is that he sees Wellington a lot mm. because he's on picket duty. He's at the front and right. Wellington will come to look at the, the layouts and things like that. Mm -hmm. So, so he says he sees the general quite a bit. Interesting. Well, yeah. Uh, moving on from bad host, where, where do we, where do we take our protagonist? So he's at Salamanca. Uh, he's he is he's right there with Rory Muir about it being sort of Wellington's masterpiece. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the the you know by God that will do. And the move is uh, instantaneous and decisive. For yeah. although some obstinate de and desperate fighting took place in the center, yep. uh, the victory was never for a moment in doubt. But at Salamanca, so he's again he's in, he's in the forefront. He's in the picket line, or where is he in that one? Yeah, he's in the, he's in the skirmish line basically, yeah. and and monitoring this. And um, so he's at Salamanca. He sees he sees what goes on, and then and then basically he earns he earns the uh, the payment that they all do because after Salamanca, he's with Wellington, not with Wellington like next to, but with the army mm -hmm. when they march into and take uh, Madrid. In right. August of 1812. Right, and that's a big victory, right there. Just Very to, much so. Yeah, just be, to capture the capital again is is phenomenal. Yeah. However, that's not the end of the Peninsula War. Oh, definitely not. Absolutely not. Um, so uh, you know, from Madrid, basically, uh, Wellington realizes he 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 needs to pull back a little bit for the for winter and all of that. You know, this the the retreat to winter quarters. Yeah, supply lines. Absolutely. Exactly. Exactly. So he um. Uh, 
winter of 1812 into 1813, they're stationed near Theodore Rodrigo. Mm-hmm. And uh, on the retreat back there, or the, or the, the sort of withdrawal back there, uh, Kincaid is appointed brigade major for the entire 1st Brigade of the Light Division. Mm-hmm. Um, and so he's he's in there when um, when when the Light Division sees action at uh, San Munoz, uh, which is, you know, one of those events where that not everybody would have seen because mm-hmm. it's, it's one of the sort of smaller ones. Right. Um, but he's there and, you know, he sort of monitors the, the first brigade. More of a skirmish, really. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Uh, in 1813, um, he's no longer uh, uh, the, the, the brigade major is basically a temporary position. Right. Because he's a captain. Uh, he doesn't get any higher than that. So I figured. Yeah, yeah, exactly. OK, uh, it's a temporary thing. Uh, so by 1813, he's back with his men. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, he's he's everywhere, right? He sees action at Munoz, San Milan. He's at Victoria. Mm-hmm. Uh, fights through the Pyrenees, right? Uh, Nivelle and Nive. Those are uh, all. Those last three are pretty big battles. They are. They are. And you know, he's he's there, and he gives he gives pretty good descriptions of of all three, right? You know, he know he knows what people are reading his book for. Mm-hmm. So, like, he's got his chapters, but every time he comes to a battle, it's basically a separate section. Mm-hmm. He's like, and here's the battle itself. Right. So you can you can read about that. Yeah. And and if you're interested in strategy or troop movements of individual units, I think that'd be a good first person account. I think so. I think so. And and one of the things I really really like about him, and we'll talk about that uh, in a little bit. But he writes really well. Mm-hmm. The way I would I would describe him is almost wry. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you can you can picture him slightly. Le- um, smiling <laughs> as he's writing this stuff right well probably he couldn't believe he lived through all that that he's writing down yeah 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 um and it's it doesn't stop there right he's at Nivelle and Neve, then he's at Bayonne and he's even at Toulouse yeah and and, the, and just so my audience just so everyone's keeping up this is the almost the end of the Peninsula War we're now invading France from Spain um the Pyrenees campaign and uh, vicious battles with Marshal Soult who's trying to protect the homeland yeah, very much so. And and in really nasty close quarters, right? Because you're in the Pyrenees. You do not have maneuverability. Mm-hmm. Uh, you are on the roads that, that have been hacked through the Pyrenees over the last, what, millennium? Right. Functionally. And and you are you are limited. Um, but they do they do push through and, and Wellington's army is is the first foreign army to, to step on French soil in a decade. Right. Right. Uh, you know, no, no, no shade on Soult. He he fights his hardest. Yeah, and he's um, a good strategist. He's a he is. Yeah, but uh, but yeah, it's just overwhelming now. He's got the Portuguese, Spanish, and British united against him, and it's just you know he's low on troops. He's dealing with conscripts. He's low on supplies. So Marshal yeah. Soult was it was an uphill battle, literally and figuratively. Absolutely, and he's not he's not getting any help because over over to the to the east, you know, we've got Leipzig, we've got the war, we've got the Sixth Coalition, right, sort of breathing down into France, right. So the is he at the final battle at? Uh, he uh, is at Toulouse, yeah. So Toulouse is traditionally the final sort of big battle, right? And Napoleon's already abdicated at this point, but the armies don't know about it yet. Exactly, it's one of those you know communication lag. It's it's like New Orleans, right? New Orleans is fought after uh, the Treaty of Ghent is signed. Correct. Uh, but but you know no one knows about it because it takes a couple of weeks to cross the Atlantic. All right, right. So. Kincaid must be thrilled. All right, great. The war's over. Um, what does he do in the? intermittent uh time between this battle and waterloo so he's um uh two months after toulouse he's made adjutant of the first battalion of the 95th okay so clearly the the, you know the brigade major and all of that someone has noticed that he's good with paperwork he's good at keeping track of this stuff um you know he, he 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 I mean, it could just quite simply be the fact that he survives and and he's he writes with a clean hand, right? Mm-hmm. Like it's, but he's made adjutant, and he stays adjutant for for quite a while. Um, and after being made adjutant, he's he's sort of he's kicking around. Uh, the the ninety fifth obviously go back to the UK, mm-hmm. and uh, he gets leave, and he's actually shooting in Scotland mm-hmm. when he hears that Napoleon has done a runner from Elba. Mm. Um, and that he's been basically recalled. So he's probably thinking, oh my gosh, I got to go back into that. Yeah. yeah, here we go again. Yeah. Uh, now, by the time it gets to him, uh, the 95th has already left English shores. So he actually makes straight for Brussels and meets them there. Mm, okay. 
Um, and he's there. He fights at both Katsukaba and Waterloo. Under Wellington again. Under Wellington again. Um, the 95th at Waterloo were, um, were basically in the sand pit and the knoll opposite La Haye Saint. Mm -hmm. um, sees a whole bunch of, of really brutal combat. He has his horse shot from under him. Yeah, and in Waterloo, I mean, La Haye Saint and Hougamount, I mean, those are the, gosh, those are the two bloodbaths, I would say. Yeah. They're just trying to, the French are trying to push the British out of there. The British know that those are the linchpins and they can't let them fall. So, yeah, just brutal, brutal battles. Exactly, exactly. And he's, you know, he's got, uh, his his narrative of Waterloo at one point turns almost apocalyptic. Yeah, yeah. You know, he's, he's talking about sort of, uh, he looks up at one point and the, 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 uh, the gun smoke is such that he thinks he's the last surviving person on earth. <laughs> right it's it's that level of like of, yep. of of writing i can imagine chaos and fire and cannon and yeah yeah i, yeah, I read i don't think it was waterloo I mean, it was leipzig or lutzen or bautzen where the cannon fire was such it was such a loud percussion that you had to keep your your jaw open otherwise your eardrums would explode because you it was that loud on the battlefield yeah so that kind of level at waterloo i'd imagine as well yeah, that's that's uh, that's still used. That's that's why uh, mortar teams are trained to say things as they launch, because their mouths are automatically opened and they're, oh, they yeah. can't they can't rupture. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So obviously we know how Waterloo ends. You know the Imperial Guard retreats and it, you know the battle turns into a rout. So where is Kincaid in all this? Is he attack? You know, is he attacking the fleeing French or is he exhausted at this point? What happens to him? So he, he does, he's in, he is in that, that charge. He's in the final charge, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, L Lord Wellington's long wished for orders to advance. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, as he says, sending our adversaries flying at the point of a bayonet. Right. Uh, so he's there. But, but after that, he basically just collapses. Oh, I mean, it's a, what a brutal battle. And it's nonstop all day, yeah. for, you know, whatever, eight, eight, 10 hours. So yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, uh, and, you know, he briefly describes the pursuit of the French, the capture of their baggage train, and the halt of the British advance at dusk. Mm -hmm. And he sums it up. It's the last line of, of the sort of the Waterloo bit. It's, it's one I it's one I truly adore. But he describes it as the last, the greatest, and the most uncomfortable heap of glory that I ever had a hand in. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, like it is glorious. But you know, like Wellington said, he. If that's a battle won, he he would never want to have a battle lost because he had to write so many yeah. letters of 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 death of spouses and husbands and people that worked under him. He had a in his dispatches there were so many of his officers dead. It was probably yeah. very brutal to be in there. Oh, absolutely, Un unquestionably. And you know he does. He basically uh, uh, he, there's a, there's a line there says I I have never yet heard of a battle in which everybody was killed, but this seemed likely to be the exception. Yeah. Yeah, just terrible, terrible. Yeah, just truly, truly brutal. Um, so good news, though. Napoleon abdicates second time. You know, the war is over. What happens to our Kincaid here? He he's promote he he sticks in the he sticks in the ninety fifth or the rifle brigade as it's now known, mm -hmm. um, and um, you know sticks around as adjutant in the peacetime service. Uh, he's promoted to captain in November of eighteen twenty five, mm -hmm. and finally sells his commission in June of eighteen thirty one. Okay. And what is he doing in his later years? Is he retired? Or does he get another job? Or? He gets he gets another job. So uh, so in eight so I so I think for for about fifteen years he just hangs out in Scotland. He retires. You know he's he is generally living the the sort of the idle life. Right. Uh, but but he clearly gets a little bored by this. Mm -hmm. So in eight in October of eighteen forty four he's made an exon of the Yeoman of the Guard. Mm. Um, and then three years later, he gets a new job in 1847 uh, when he's made inspector of pr for prisons in Scotland. Okay. So he's clearly just riding around Scotland, looking at prisons. Right. Uh, and making sure that, you know, their, their conditions are fine and their, their, their walls are, are serviceable and that sort of thing. Right. Um, when does the first edition of his memoirs actually get published, though? That gets published in, in 1830. So okay. that's that's basically what he does. Uh, I think he sells his commission and he's like, oh, I can make, I, you know, he sees this coming out. He's like, I can make my money off this. So he sells his commission. Are they hugely popular? Or? They are. They okay. absolutely are. Yeah, okay. they are. They are massively well received. He okay. writes two. Um, and the first one is is universally well received. The second one is sort of 
okay, more of the same, but you know, it, that difficult second album, right? You know, it's, yeah. even if it's just as good, it's yeah. not going to be received the same way. Yeah, the sophomore slump. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Uh, I'll talk about his, his memoirs in a second, but just to, just to finish off, uh, 1850, he, he adds uh, the factories of Scotland in the north of England to his portfolio in inspections. Mm -hmm. So he's riding around even more. And in 1852, he's made a senior exon of the Yeoman of the Guard and knighted at the same mm. time. So that's where that's, the, the sir from. Exactly, yeah. Sir John Kincaid. Uh, he sticks around for a fair while, though. He, he dies of liver disease in April of 1862. Wow, he's pretty old. Yeah, yeah. At which point he holds, obviously, the Waterloo Medal, as well as uh, the Military General Service Medal, with seven clasps, which is not a bad haul. Yeah, I'd say. That's a lot of awards. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's interesting story, our protagonist. Thank you for uh, giving giving the details on that. Let's let's get into his memoirs a little bit, though. Yeah. So he writes two, as I said. He writes Adventures in the Rifle Brigade in the Peninsula of France and the Netherlands from 1809 to 1815, to give it its full title. It's traditionally referred to as Adventures in the Rifle Brigade. Mm -hmm. And that comes out in 1830. And then five years later, clearly inspired by, um, by the success, <laughs> he writes uh, Random Shots of a Rifleman. Ah. which is it's not it's the first one is pretty much a strict chronological narrative with, right. with with obviously moments where he drops out to tell anecdotes and things like that right random shots is very much more a collection of anecdotes there's no over over thread or anything like that right um, which may explain why you know it didn't it wasn't as well received you know mm -hmm. it, it's it's not as compelling it's not <laughs> as page turning it's it's good He's, he writes well but it's yeah. not uh, it doesn't have quite the same thing. Like in modern terms, it was more of a money grab, the second one. I think so. Family wise, was he ever married? Did he have kids or anything like that? He was married, yeah. He um he uh uh his his wife um survived him, a woman by the name of Louisa. Mm -hmm. Uh I don't believe he had kids. Okay. Uh although if one of if one of your readers can correct me on that, I will happily take that correction. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, but I don't believe he had kids, but he definitely had a wife. I, I genuinely, he writes, he writes a fair amount about women. And I get the feeling the, the guy was over six, two, was over six feet. He was pretty slender. Right. And the rifle uniform, as we all know, is not a bad one to wear. No, no. So I, I have a sneaking suspicion he did okay with the women. He was a ladies man. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Especially, especially given that sort of, that level of, of, he clearly had the gift of the gab. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the the books sound fascinating. I'll have to look into these because it's the memoirs. Just are like you said, they're wry, they're witty, and I think they have a nice appeal to to the to the reader of the era. Yeah, so um, you know, uh, they're ex extremely well received. Um, the United Service Journal uh, basically says it's perfect, and he's the beau ideal of a thoroughgoing soldier of service, mm -hmm. and actually compares the book itself to the Rifle Brigade. <laughs> Uh, basically noting it's trimmed in green and its fire is brisk and effective. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, the Athenaeum calls it one of the most lively histories of a soldier's adventures that have yet appeared. Yeah. Um, and the monthly magazine, in, ta in terms of true praise, basically says the book has only one fault. It's too short. <laughs> you don't hear that about books too often. You really don't. Yeah. And yeah, they're, they're, you're right. There's a romanticism to the era, especially the uniforms, like uh, the Hussars on the French side. And um, yeah, there's just, you know, there's something about that age and time that makes you want to be there or at least witness it, which is probably why uh, Sharps Rifles was such uh, a popular show. Oh, I think so. I, you know, that, and you know, you, you, you get those, you, t you, you, uh, you put actors in those uniforms and you, you get that drama and, you know, people just eat it up. I right. did. That's the, you know, those books are how I got into this period. Right. Right. Uh, uh, they're my, my, my father threw me one for a Christmas present when I was probably a little too young to read it and just never looked back. Hooked you. Yeah. It hooked you. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Well, yeah, no, I, I, I thank you for all that. That's wonderful stuff. Um, yeah. Just one, just one final point I want to, yeah. I want to make about the memoirs because there is, there is actually something really interesting here. Yeah. So, that. What is the legacy of these memoirs? Yeah, so here's the thing, right? So uh, Sir John Fortescue, the, the legendary historian of the British Army, uh, write, basically edits a version of them in, 1820, in 1929. Mm -hmm. And he says, you know, the daily, uh, he praises uh, the Kincaid's descriptions of his fellow soldiers, the daily routine of the, of the campaign, and says that they are 
of real historical value. Mm -hmm. And as long as the rifle brigade lasts, his adventures will be a textbook for all good riflemen. Mm. However, um, he also notes and condemns Kincaid for, and I quote, a certain flippancy uh, in his narrative of what Fortescue considered a very serious subject. Mm. Right? It's that level of, of, of sort of humor. Yeah, the glib. Uh, the glib part of it, yeah. Exactly. Uh, you know, there, there's a there's a there's a hint. Uh, the way I describe it in my book at one point is that is it sort of sums up the madcap lunacy of war. Right. But there's a, there's a little bit of almost like a black adder goes forth thing going on here. Yeah, like a almost like a gallows humor. Exactly. Very much so. But to me, you know, I think that's what makes Kincaid interesting and successful. Mm -hmm. Right. His rise sense of humor reads much more modern than 1830. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's and I honestly, you know, it's not just me. The scholars, most notably Neil Ramsey, who wrote a great book called *The Military Memoir in Romantic Literary Culture*, mm -hmm. makes the case that Kincaid actually marks the beginning of the transition from sort of the sentimental memoirs of the Romantic literary tradition to boys' own adventures that came. They became hugely popular in Victorian and Edwardian military writing. Mm. Yeah, because it's not necessarily meant to be. A historical book of what happened during the Peninsula War and Waterloo. He's he's adding his own touch to it. Very much so. And and he makes it very clear. Like he he says openly, he's like, look, if you want just a history, there are other and better books to read. Well, yeah, well, and, and circling back to where we begin with with your book, you know, there's plenty of books on Waterloo, you know, that start from eleven AM and end at nine o'clock at night when Napoleon's retreating. But that's been so done over many, many other books. And like you said, there's, there's probably very good books on that. And your, your book, you didn't want to do that. No, I really didn't. You know, I, I, and I, and I had to write the introduction a bit, like it's like the second or third paragraph of the introduction. I'm like, this is not a book on the battle of Waterloo. Right. Right. You know, please, you know, I, I'm hoping it's early enough that someone reading it in the bookstore <laughs> will read that before they buy it. And then, you know, yell at me. Right. Uh, <laughs> Right. I, I probably got a few emails that said, this isn't about Waterloo. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, you know, it is, it's about the culture and the memory and, right. you know, it just, it, it was, it was just, it fascinated me. Right. And, right. and as I, as I, as I researched more and I dug more, I realized that there was just so much, it, you know, there, there is, there is everything. There are, there's, there's balls and banquets. Um, there's door knockers, snuff, colors yeah. of blue, uh, dozens of streets, taverns, hotels, yeah. uh, all tied to this, mm -hmm. a and and just sort of watching all of that unfold right. was just uh, not only not only a privilege, but also just and, and to put it simply, it was fun. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like a little ex exploring exploring history campaign of your own. Yeah, yeah. Well, I. Thank you again. I want my uh, readers, uh, I'd like to go over it real quick again, to check out your website, LukeALReynolds.com. And you can learn about Luke's book, uh, Who Owned Waterloo? Uh, you can learn about Luke. A lot of information there, correct? Absolutely. And, um, and for those of you who want uh, sort of the more, the more direct route, you can also find me on Twitter at um, L-U-R-E-Y-N-O-L, at Lurinal. Um, and my pinned tweet is a link to the Oxford University Press site for my book. So, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. and I think there's a there's a discount code in there that is still active. Oh, well, there you go. I, uh, I will I will say in that it is it is an academically priced monograph. I apologize <laughs> to all your listeners for that. But if you are interested but hesitant, the paperback is coming out in November. Okay. Well, uh, I'll make a note of that because that'll save a few bucks right there. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, no, Luke's Twitter page is actually how I discovered Luke. Um, Really interesting stuff he posts there, so I'd recommend following him on Twitter as well. Luke, it was a pleasure, my friend. I, I hope you can come back again soon. I learned a lot in that brief time that, you know, 50 or so minutes we spent together. So thank you for that. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. It was an absolute delight. And uh, I'll see if I can find someone who's of even lower rank for next time. <laughs> <laughs> right. If you could do a sergeant or a private, that'd be fantastic. Yeah. We'll, 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 we'll figure out something. <laughs>